Dean Kirschling, thank you so much for, um, for inviting me to come and give this presentation. I also want to thank you for being a phenomenal leader, both locally here in Baltimore as well as nationally. Many of you may know about her national work in mental health and end-of-life care and so many other things. And I'm very privileged to, to, to be able to work with you now and to be able to come and speak with all of you today, too. Um, I'm also happy to be here with you, um, and um, I work very closely with, with your president, with President Jay Perman, who I think all of you know is not only a phenomenal leader and administrator, but also is a pediatrician. And I remember that the first time that I spoke with Dr. Perman, he mentioned these, um, the work that he does as a pediatrician, these rounds that he does. And in his rounds, he does them not just with as we usually do in medicine, not just with healthcare providers. I mean, we already talk about interdisciplinary care as being important with doctors and nurses and PAs and social workers working together and already doing rounds together is important, but he also has law students. He also has others from other professions come in and do these rounds. And to me, that really symbolizes what it means to address these social determinants of health because we cannot see medicine as simply be about what happens within the four walls of the hospital. It's about so much more. Um, some of you may have seen the news that is happening right now and may have seen me doing a couple of, of TV interviews as you were, as you were coming in. Um, just in the last hour or so, President Trump is announcing um, that there is a state of emergency around the opioid epidemic. And I was talking about how the, and I'll address this in, my, in, in, in some of what we're talking about today too, but I want to reflect on this because this is breaking news that literally just happened. Um, but some of what um, I was addressing was that it's important to, to call out the issue. And so I'm glad that the president has mentioned the opioid epidemic, is telling stories of individuals who he's encountered along the way who have died from overdose and who have the disease of addiction. I'm glad that we are addressing the issue. But at the same time, he stopped short of calling it a national state of emergency. He declared it a public health emergency, not a national state of emergency. And the difference there is not just in semantics. Actually, there's a big difference because a national state of emergency comes with it a specific commitment to resources, a specific commitment to funding. And all of us, I think, in this room, I'm really preaching to the choir to talk about why that's important, but what I understand of the declaration so far, and again, the announcement was happening as I was on my way over, but what I understand of the declaration so far is that it will be repurposing existing funds. And public health funds, as all of you know, is quite limited. And every time when it comes to making a budget, whether it's a budget for my agency at the health department or more broadly for any budget for health, we always think about what are we, what will we have to cut in order to make this work? Are we going to stop funding HIV? Are we going to reduce funding for disease investigations? Are we going to reduce restaurant inspections? I mean, what, what is the repurposing that will have to happen in order for us to address this epidemic? And so, that's part of what, what, what I was talking about earlier. And I think that um, it also speaks to why we're all here, that there are dual components of what I want to address in this talk, which are, first is, how do we really understand these social determinants? What does that mean? And the second component of, how can we be effective in our advocacy, knowing that it often is really difficult that we often feel like we're working against a lot of other tides because people may not know what public health is about or why our work is so important. And so I want to get at both of those issues today. But I want to add a caveat before I go on because I did mention the president and I will be mentioning about other policies as we, um, as, as we continue in our conversations. So the dean at the, at, at the University of Maryland College Park uh, Boris Lushniak, who is um, a hero of mine and has done incredible things. He was the acting Surgeon General among, um, uh, among many other things that he's done in his distinguished career in the Public Health Commission Corps. He said to me once that we should think about our work as being political but not partisan. And I think this is an important point because as a public official, I don't want to be partisan in my work. 
I don't want to be talking about Republicans and Democrats and Republicans are good or bad. Or, I mean, I, don't, I want to avoid that conversation. But that said, I don't think I can do my job without being political. Everything we do involves the political realities in some way. Even if I say the word ACA, that conjures up a lot of political connotations. Or Medicaid. How can I, in my job, not talk about Medicaid? Medicaid in Baltimore City covers more than half of our pregnant women and our children. Tens of thousands of them depend on Medicaid and Children's Health Insurance Program. If there are proposals that potentially would gut Medicaid, it's my job to talk about it. And it's my job to say, not Republican proposal this or Democratic proposal this, but rather it's to say, here is the impact on the populations that I serve. And I think as a physician, and I think for all of you as providers too, it's the same thing, that it's our job to say, here is the impact of that proposal on my patients. Here is how it could increase access to healthcare, how it could decrease access to healthcare. Here is how it could deprive people who may be the most vulnerable of a critical safety net. And so I want to use that distinction to help frame this conversation as well, that some of my remarks may sound political because they are. I don't think I can avoid talking about politics and policy in a conversation about public health in today's reality. But it's not going to be partisan. And in the same statement about President Trump and the announcement that he made today, what I'm saying is not a criticism of President Trump. It's a reflection of what we need on the ground in Baltimore City is the following. Something that I had emphasized actually to, um, to, to, to the reporters when I was talking to them outside is the scope of the epidemic in Baltimore City are actually horrendous. You know, we, we often say these numbers and then they become, they, they become easy for us to talk about because they sound like statistics. Last year in Baltimore City, 694 people died from overdose. 694 people, that's two people a day who died from overdose. It becomes a statistic, but think about how many families that affects how many neighbors and friends and colleagues, and how much it tears at the fabric of our city. And think about all those other individuals who may not die because of their overdose, but who have an addiction and are not able to get treated. One of the most devastating things working in the ER that I encountered is my patients coming in to say that they need help. And I remember this young woman who came in over and over again. Actually, she was in the ER probably every day maybe every other day, but she, you know, she, we knew her so well, which is not good if you know your patient so well in the ED that you can recite their entire medical history. But I knew her so well because we saw her all the time. And she always came in with one thing, which was she asked for help for her addiction. And every time she would say, I need help. I want a bed. I want to stop. I need help. Every nurse, every social worker, every doctor, we all knew that she needed help. Her family needed, knew she needed help. But every time we would have to tell her, I'm sorry, maybe I can get you to see someone in a week. Maybe it's three weeks, maybe it's a month. And I wanna know, for what other disease do we ever find that statement to be acceptable? Do we say to somebody, sorry you're having a heart attack right now, but maybe if you're not dead in three weeks, come back then. Right? We would never find that to be acceptable. We would never find it acceptable that only one in 10 patients who have the disease of addiction, the disease of addiction, because it is a disease, right? We would never say to somebody who has the disease of cancer that, sorry, only one in 10 of you will get treatment. But that is what's happening for the disease of addiction. So when I talk about my reflection to the president's statement, it's a reflection of what we need on the ground. It's devastating that I have to turn away my patients who need help for a disease. Here in Baltimore, we have done a lot to save lives, but we're actually being, we're being priced out of the ability to do so. That's a problem, and that's why we need these resources. And so that's why I'm setting the frame as it is to say problems that we need to address. We cannot see, these, we cannot see individuals as statistics. We have to understand that scope and how it affects us but um, also keep an eye on how the social determinants are critically influenced by policies and by politics that are in our, in our realities too. Um, something else that I want to tell you in framing our conversation, speaking of statistics, is I know that all of us have heard about 
the 20-year difference in life expectancy, right, that we see right here in our backyard. That there are neighborhoods in West Baltimore and downtown and other areas where the life expectancy is 20 years less than a neighborhood just a few miles away. And that also becomes a statistic. But I think about what it means for a child born today, depending on where they happen to be born, to live 20 years less or 20 years more and what that actually means. And what bothers me in all of this, multiple things. First is that people talk about health care as the reason. Health care is a big part of it. But what determines how long someone lives isn't just about the health care that they receive in the hospital. It also ties to education, ties to jobs, it ties to housing, and importantly, it also ties to poverty and socioeconomic status. It's been said that if the currency of inequality is years of life, then the opposite of poverty is health. And for me, as a clinician, I often feel like I'm not doing my job and that I'm actually being, that I'm not being a, the clinician that I want to be when I have a child coming in with asthma who I know that what this child needs is not just more inhalers or steroids, but what that child, maybe that child is homeless and maybe living with people or in a shelter where other people smoke. And that's why they're coming in with an asthma exacerbation, but how am I helping that child with their housing? I often feel powerless to do that. Or what happens if another child who comes in with asthma, actually what they need is housing re remediations to assist them because maybe they have mold in their homes and allergies and that's why they have asthma. Or for that patient of mine with overdose, what is it that I can really do to not only help that person right then get reversed with Narcan, which is important because we have to save their life now, but how can I go about addressing their addiction and getting them the help that they really need? And so to add an additional frame to everything that we're doing here, it's the frame that the conversation about things being a choice need to, need to change. Because when we state that it's a choice, we're saying that it's that person's fault that this is occurring. If we frame addiction as a choice, then we're saying that if this person ends up dying or incarcerated or having their lives destroyed in some way and we can't get help for them, it's their fault. Or if we say it's a choice, then it's that person's fault that they have heart disease and diabetes and can't have a good diet without taking into account that maybe they live in a food desert where they have to take two buses and walk another six blocks in order to get fr fresh fruits and vegetables. So it's the recognition, too, that choice is predicated on privilege. And that is another part of what we have to do in our work to address these social determinants and to really make an impact at the end of the day. And so I was asked today to come and give a call to action because I think so often we talk about issues and problems and statistics and, there, and then we feel kind of hopeless about what we can do. But what I want to do today is to give you three examples of things that we can tangibly do today. And as I do that, I also want to introduce one of our fellows, um, one of our Baltimore Corps fellows at the health department, who is Morgan Franklin. Um, she is, uh, she just started wor working with us and has already been, been making a big impact. And I actually think that one of the call to actions to our students in the room is that you should do what you can right now. Don't wait until you can make a difference. And Morgan has already helped us a lot, including with a couple of the programs that I'll be talking about. But right now, she'll be handing out a sign-up sheet for those who are interested in finding out more about our programs and want to help us directly as part of our call to action. But I want to give you three things for what it is that we're doing. And then I invite your comments about whether you think these are the right things or whether we should be doing something that's, that, that, that's different. Three things. First thing that we do is that we start as early as possible. We believe in starting as early as possible in intervening, in, in our, uh, in intervening because that is where we're going to have the biggest impact. And actually, one of the programs that we partnered with Dr. Perman on speaks to this. So how many of you have heard about our program, Be More for Healthy Babies? I know you heard about it in the introduction earlier today, but Be More for Healthy Babies. All right, a lot of you have. Yesterday was actually the eighth anniversary celebration at the National Aquarium. We had a 1,000 plus families come to celebrate. And this program, back in 2009, Baltimore had one of the worst infant mortality rates in the country. 
I mean, our babies were dying at the same rate as babies born in the middle of civil war in other countries. Totally unacceptable. Another thing that unacceptable in that er in that time was that an African American baby born in 2009 was five times more likely to die than a white baby. So we started this program in partnership, including with the University of Maryland, we st and and with many other partners. And as a result of doing things like home visiting. So that nurses, social workers, community health workers visit women in their homes, as a result of teaching about breastfeeding, about the ABCs of safe sleep, we have reduced the number of uh, or the the percentage of infants dying by almost 40 percent in the last seven years, which I think is remarkable. I mean, that's equivalent to 50, 50, 50 babies that would have died in 2009. Who are now able to survive today. Now, there's a lot more work that has to be done. By the way, we've also closed that disparity between black and white infant death by over 50%. But that disparity is still there, it's still glaring, and there's still a lot more to do. But we strongly believe in intervening early on and providing our children with the best opportunity to be able to thrive from that very early stage. Another program that I'm very proud of that has the um, that 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 has the same that that has a similar um, that has a uh, a similar um, approach that Morgan is is um, is integrally involved in is our program called Vision for Baltimore. When I first came to to uh, to, to the city, I found that we were the Maryland law requires for children to get screening for glasses in pre-K, first grade, and eighth grade. So I wear contacts and glasses, and I see that a lot of you, me too. How many of you were diagnosed with vision problems sometime between first grade and eighth grade? A lot of you were. And so if you're only doing screenings in those three years, you're potentially missing a lot of children. I mean, I was diagnosed when I was in the third grade, and I remember looking at the board blurrily and not knowing that you're not supposed to do that, right? That I didn't know that that was abnormal. And um, we also found out when I first came here, another, another startling statistic, which is that only 20% of children who screened as needing glasses were actually getting them. So we estimated that about 15,000 of our students actually needed glasses, but just couldn't get them for a whole variety of reasons, including lack of ability to pay, not having insurance, not having transportation, or parents not being able to miss work. And so we said, look, this is a problem that has a solution. And I'm a big fan of data, and I'm a researcher and a scientist, but I don't need another study to tell me that if kids can't see, they can't read. If they can't read, they may not succeed in school, and they may even be labeled as being problem kids or disruptive in class when what they needed was something as simple as a pair of glasses. So we started this program that Morgan is now working on called Vision for Baltimore, which aims to get glasses to every child who needs them, screenings and glasses in every grade, K through eight, regardless of the ability to pay and regardless of, um, of transportation, because we do the screenings and the glasses right in the schools, right where children are without the child missing school or the parent missing work. That's the core of what public health can do, to start early because that one simple intervention can make a big difference in that child's life. So first is to start as early as possible. Nobody's throwing things at me yet, so I think I'm, I'm, I'm on the right track, but feel free to, 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 to disagree, if you will, as well. The second thing, second part of our approach, and I urge all of us to do this, and this call to action, is that we have to tell our stories, and specifically the stories of what difference that policy or intervention can make. Now, it's been said that Public health saved your life today. You just don't know it. Because really, there is no face of public health. Public health is all about preventing something from happening. And so we do, for example, restaurant inspections. By the way, if you ever want to know clean restaurants in the city, I'm the person to ask. Not necessarily the good restaurants, but the clean, but the clean ones. Um, we do restaurant inspections. And there is, you, will, you can picture, there is a face of a restaurant that was closed or a chain of restaurants that were closed because of a foodborne illness, right? That's happened. 
But what is the face of an outbreak that could have happened if not for the inspections that we did? There's no face of that. There's a face of someone who was shot, and maybe the face of family members who are mourning. But what is the face of someone who could have gotten shot if not except for the violence mediation work that we did? Or the face of someone who could have gotten shot except for the work that we did in the first place to help keep them in school and prevent them from joining gangs and to get glasses to them in the first place and to help the baby be healthy? I mean, what is the face of something that didn't happen? It's really tough, I think, in this environment to address this because we always talk about the cost of that intervention. In the debates about the ACA, we heard about the cost of Medicaid. And yes, it is expensive. But what about, we think about, for example, let's talk about pregnant women for, for a second, which is an issue very close, in, which is an issue very near and dear to me for a reason that I'll tell you now, which is that um, I just gave birth nine weeks ago, actually, to a baby boy. Thank you. And um, my, my baby is very healthy and happy, and, I'm, and this is my first week back at work, and so I'm a little bit emotional thinking about my, my baby, but, I'm, um, but, um, it's, but I recently went through this, and during my, my pregnancy, which was, I, I'm a pretty healthy person, I wouldn't have anticipated that I would have had certain health conditions come up. And I was very lucky to have an excellent OB to also have great health insurance because every time my OB said, you need to get this test, you need to get this ultrasound, you need to get this blood work, I never questioned it. I always said, of course I'll do that, because my insurance will cover it. I don't know what I would have done if I were in a situation where every time something came up, if what choices I would have to make. Would I choose to get the ultrasound that can help to save the life of this baby? or would I choose to pay for food for the rest of my family? What are the trade-offs that would have to happen? You know, studies have also shown that women who do not get prenatal care are five times more likely to have babies who die than women who do get prenatal care. Those same studies also show that women who get insufficient prenatal care also are much more likely to have low birth weight babies, babies who spend a lot of time in the ICU, which, by the way, in addition to this being a humanitarian issue that we should do everything possible to keep our babies healthy, but this is also a fiscal issue too. Why should we be spending money down the line when we can be spending it up front? That, that's going to be a lot cheaper. That's something that we need to all do. We need to talk not only about the cost of an intervention, we have to talk about the cost of doing nothing. We also, as clinicians, we're on the front lines too. We see why these interventions are so important. And my call to action for all of us is that we have to talk about how this is going to impact our patients. Remember that data provide context, but stories compel action. And it's the stories, the individual stories of your patients. And I don't mean to name them by name and say, Mr. So-and-so, and this is why, you know, this is how it's going to impact that person. But all of you have see this daily. You can talk about the pregnant women that you see, the children that you help, the seniors who could also be priced out of their ability to pay for life-saving medications. All of these things are what we have to be addressing. And remember to tell these stories because we have to put a face on prevention or else nobody else is going to. Third approach, third thing, and then I would love to hear your, your thoughts, is that we fight stigma with science. You know, I think about addiction, front, front of mind for me right now because we're talking about the state of emergency declaration today, but when I issued the blanket prescription that, that you heard about to our residents in our city, I always thought it was about saving lives. I mean, to me, that there's nothing more basic than if naloxone is an antidote, somebody is overdosing right now, I can save their life, I have to give this medication to people. That's what I would think about, and as a result, you heard that we have been able to save more than 1,200 lives in the last two years alone. I mean, that's, that's what it's about for me as, as a physician. That's what it's about for me as a human being, really, that if somebody is dying right now, I have to save their lives right now. But what I heard from some people, and actually from a lot of people, when I issued the blanket prescription was, 
Why would you do that? Isn't it going to make people use more drugs? Well, I would say if somebody is dying right now from a peanut allergy, would you ever say to them, "Well, I'm sorry, I'm not going to give you an EpiPen because it might make you eat more peanuts next time"? We would never say that. In the same way, we don't say to somebody with diabetes, "Why are you still on insulin? Can't you just work on your issues and you'll be done?" Right? Why? Why are you so weak that you're still on insulin? If we understand addiction to be a brain, chronic brain disease, the same way that we understand other diseases, then we have to accept that ultimately it's about saving lives and getting people into treatment. That we have to use evidence-based treatments. By the way, we also have similar issues.、Um, when my predecessors, I'm, I'm fortunate to work in the health department and to have predecessors who are not afraid to take progressive stances. When we started needle exchange in the city more than 20 years ago, people made those same arguments of, well, wouldn't needle exchange encourage people to use more drugs? Actually, what we've seen is that the percentage of people with HIV from IV drug use decreased from 63% in 1994 to 7% in 2014. That is the power of public health to save lives, and this is why we have to focus on addressing the science and combating stigma, because we have to use science as a way to stop all of these other、um, all of these other conversations. You know, I think that it's our job to to be able to do that. We're the ones who see our patients. We're the ones who have the science. Many people may not know. They may have misconceptions for any number of reasons, from the media, from other sources. And it's our job to be able to point that out. And we have to be unafraid to call out the problems that we see. Now, I would say that none of what I'm asking for us to do now, and even the scope of the issues—they're so big and so broad—but none of the issues that we're talking about now are easy for us to address. And we didn't go into this work, though, because it's easy. And working in the ER, if a patient is in front of me dying right now, it's never my option to say, "Well, this is just too hard," or "It's somebody else's problem to contend with." I see the same thing when it comes to fighting these bigger issues too. That advocacy is not easy. That social justice is not easy. That serving our patients and serving our communities is not easy. But there is no more important time than now for us to do it.